In this video, I want to look at what makes community-supported agriculture so successful and what factors make it work. Hey, and welcome to this video all about community-supported agriculture. We've got one right on our doorstep here. We grow mushrooms over there, but there's a CSA project called School Farm right on our doorstep. And we've seen a boom recently with people signing up for these kinds of projects. It's all about local food, sustainability, connection with the growers. And in this video, I want to explore what kind of factors a successful community-supported agriculture project have and also what kind of risks they face. So right now as I'm recording this, it's a great time for CSA. Demand is booming, people are wondering where their food is coming from. It's during the COVID-19 crisis and people have been scared by these long supply chains being interrupted. CSA's Community Supported Agriculture projects have been around since the 80s and simply describe a model of subscription farming where customers commit to support a farm for an entire season by paying for their produce, either up front or by monthly direct debits of a monthly payment. From the farmer's point of view, this commitment provides a guaranteed market and allows to farm in a more low input, ecological way. In return, the members have a connection, a direct connection with the people and the fields producing their food, and the opportunity to get involved with how their food is produced. So a common theme amongst all of these um, CSA projects, and I'll look at a few later on in this video, but a common theme is that they look at how to grow food better rather than simply bigger like Big Ag does. So as I mentioned, at the heart of it is this balance of a risk and reward system. So if you get that balance right, it can benefit the grower as well as the consumer. The consumer can know the grower and know where the food is coming from, so it's got a good traceability. The provenance of your food can be really important. The food spends less time in shipping, so long cold store supply chains. Less time in shipping means that lower CO2 emissions as well. And you can, of course, get involved with this. It's the, the shared system means that you can access the fields and you can likely help out by volunteering and learning about your food. And when you pick up your box each week, you get the chance to see the food evolving, to see what's happening with the food that will end up on your plate. And here's five great reasons why you should consider joining a CSA where you are or perhaps set one up and run it yourself. The reasons are... It often provides really excellent value for money. Food is often grown organically, it's grown locally, and you get access to this. It's ultra fresh, it's local, it's of good quality, but it also supports the local livelihoods of the farmers, so it benefits the local economy. And it's not just about supporting the local economy. Projects like these also benefit the local community. So you can be part of this CSA community likely make new friends, get to meet new families, but also in times of need, these community-supported agriculture projects can perform a particularly unique role. I've seen examples during this crisis, for instance, where people are not able to afford their monthly payment, and what happens within a CSA structure is that there are um, pay-it-forward schemes popping up. Isn't that wonderful? So you get people who say, okay, yes, I can actually afford to pay a little bit extra and help other vulnerable people in the community. I've also seen an example of a local project here who, um, during this time of COVID-19 crisis, still take order from the most vulnerable people in the community, whereas other people are not able to order. And that's just wonderful to see. So it does strengthen the local community. And then finally, I just wanted to add this benefit to it. It creates more biodiversity where you live. So you can see in the picture there a prime example of just beautifully grown veg, locally grown veg. And typical crops for community supported agriculture schemes tend to be salad, vegetables, fruits. Um, some add flowers into the mix, which is a wonderful thing. And then you can also think of meat schemes or dairy schemes, of course. But there's much more that can be added in terms of a um, community supported agriculture project. You can think of um, things like tours at your farm, but also training. A lot of these provide training in terms of developing horticultural skills where you are. So you might be aware that here at Grow Cycle we grow mushrooms in a low tech way. And that's something I noticed with the community supported agriculture scheme. Not 
any of the projects I've seen grow mushrooms, which is a real shame because I think it's based on a misunderstanding of this crop being too technical to grow or difficult to grow, and it doesn't need to be when you grow it in a low-tech way. So I'm hopeful that more CSA projects will decide to grow mushrooms, especially in the UK here, where it can be a crop that fills in what we call the hungry gap. And the hungry gap is a hard time of year for UK farmers. It's a few weeks, usually in April or May, early June, after the winter crops have ended and the new season's plantings are not ready to harvest yet. And then another crop that I haven't seen many CSA grows is uh, microgreens and that is another crop that you can cultivate indoors of course in a vertical way so it doesn't need a lot of space. It's also quite high value. They may be tiny these microgreens but a study shows that microgreens punch well above their weight when it comes to nutrition. So researchers found microgreens like red cabbage, coriander which is cilantro if you're in the States, um, and radish contain up to 40 times higher level of vital nutrients than their mature counterparts. And that is something that your local community would definitely be interested in. We've grown them here and especially our kids absolutely love them, which is great to see because it's fresh, healthy, nutritious food. So if you feel inspired by CSA schemes and you want to have a look at some projects which have been running for a while and are successful. I've just selected three. There's many, many more, of course, and hopefully there's one local to you as well that you can join. Three that I wanted to touch on. Um, there's one in called Chag Food here in the UK. It's based in Chag Ferd um, in Devon. And the scheme was started in 2010. It's got around 120 boxes per week and it operates on a seven acres field of organic vegetables, herbs, and this CSA adds flowers as well to their books. I met one of the driving forces some time ago, Ed, and he and Chinny do great work on this project together with their local community, as well as Samson the horse. So if you're in the UK and you want to set up a CSA scheme or you want to scale up your existing scheme, do check them out because they've got a course that can help you and to get access to all of their experience and knowledge. It's an absolute steal. I think they run a two-day course for £150 or so and that's incredibly good value. So the second one that I wanted to highlight is one over in Canada. It's called Jardin de la Grelinette and it's a 10-acre micro farm in Saint-Armand in Quebec in Canada. This one was set up by Jean-Martin Fortier and his partner Maud Hélène. And you can see an aerial view of the farm here. It's really diverse, as many of these projects are, of course. And with only one and a half acres cultivated in permanent beds, the farm grosses more than $100,000 per acre with operating margins of about 60%. And this is enough to financially sustain their family. So these people are making it work in terms of making a living out of it. Now, the other point I wanted to add is that Jean-Martin is very into educating people and helping other farmers start up. So if you're interested in that, do look him up. This farm feeds more than 200 families through their CSA shares, and they also sell at the farmer's markets. And like I said, Jean-Martin is very generous in terms of his knowledge, and he offers plenty of tips for people who want to do similar things. And then back here in the UK, another project I wanted to touch on is the, called the Apricot Centre. It's on our doorstep here in Totnes. We actually supply these, uh, this project with our mushrooms as well, which we're really proud of. This project is supported by the community. It raised £220,000 from the community in the spring of 2017. And the team then went on to plant over 1,000 fruit trees and bushes, 3,000 agroforestry trees, and establish the beginning of the vegetable production. They've got a flock of 130 hens for eggs. They've got polytunnels. They also welcome two cows called damson and daffodil on the farm. So I'm recording this, as I mentioned, during the COVID-19 crisis. And this is a wonderful project that has just stepped into the community and said, OK, we're going to help out here. The community responded, their um, customers, the families that they help out, that boomed from 60 families to 260 families. And I'm hopeful that this will be a lasting effect for this project. So I mentioned they really stepped up to the plate. They really stepped in to help the community. They form a really crucial role in distributing local food. So they've added lots of other local produce like kimchi, 
milk, beer, and like I said, our mushrooms as well, which is just an awesome result. So that's a lot of good stuff about CSAs, of course, and it can work really, really well, but it's not the full story, of course. Pulling something like this off takes a lot of planning, a lot of organization, and very solid growing skills. This is not to be underestimated, because what you're trying to do is feed families. You need to offer diversity in the boxes. You want to offer between seven, 11 vegetables each week, for instance. And you can imagine that timing is really, really crucial. If you get all of this timing wrong and you can't harvest for the first few weeks or so, your customers aren't going to be happy. If, on the other hand, you get the timing so wrong that your box scheme, the season has ended, and then you get all your vegetables, then you know, you've set yourself up for no end of problems, really. So as a result of this, lots of projects actually do fail. So there's 95% of farms fail in the first five years. And that's such a shame because it comes at a time when demand for these projects is booming and it shows how difficult it can be. And it's a pretty sobering thought, actually. So what happens then with these 95% that fail? Well, somehow the risk and reward balance is just tipped the wrong way. And I've got five reasons for why this might happen. So which then are these dangers that are lurking there for CSAs who are starting up or looking to scale up? Well, the first one is that often you see that um, a lot of people who want to be growing food focus more on the growing of the plants, growing of the produce and their lifestyle rather than the marketing of it. So if you look on your screen now, you can check out for instance Shared Legacy Farm, which is a US-based CSA. And it's a really, really easy to join scheme. It's got a great website. It's got the whole experience dialed in and you can see it on the screen here. It's really nicely done. So I'm not surprised they've already sold out of their shares for this year. They're easy graphics. It's a straightforward pricing model. The promise is a good one. And if you aim to give a whole family of food experience like this, it's a completely different thing than simply dropping off some calories and vitamins. So this CSA goes so far as to teach what you can do with your weekly box, how you can unpack it and what you can grow, um, sorry, what you can do with the food they provide. And that takes it to a completely different level. So that's awesome to see. The second danger is that you focus on the wrong crops with not enough margin. So not enough margin typically leads to needing an enormous scale. That doesn't sit very well with a small scale farming setup and a diverse local project. So you need a great crop plan as a result. This can be really tricky to pull off and it needs some consistency, crop succession and diversity for your customers. These are all different factors that interplay. And if you get them wrong, you set yourself up for trouble. And as with any business, if you're not focused enough on your core activities, you probably are going to have trouble down the line. So if you do want to grow a ton of different varieties and you want to provide farm tours and you want to train people and you want to do lots and lots more, then it really, really will stretch you. And that's a danger to your project. Another common danger is that there's not enough focus on the numbers. So if you think about just convincing yourself that yes, you are covering your costs, you've bought your seeds, you're putting in the time, you're getting a result, people have paid into the scheme, but when you look at it on a fair basis and you are the one subsidizing the project by just throwing your time at it, that's not a sustainable way to grow your project. So it's easy to convince yourself that you're covering the costs, but you do need to look at it so you don't end up paying yourself below a living wage and subsidizing the project. So the final one I've identified is when there's not enough focus on the community that actually supports the CSA project. So if you simply stop at delivering the box and you don't engage further with a letter or with your members to make sure they understand what is happening and the awesome thing they're supporting, then you're really missing a trick. Think of it in terms of retention numbers as well. So if you were to retain 50% retain of your customers or by doing things like adding tips, newsletters, or a private Facebook group, for instance, for your members in which you unbox the CSA box. If you push those retention numbers up to 80%, it's quite easy to see how you save a ton of time in trying to recruit members for the new year. And all these things are perfectly possible. I mean, I've just shown you Shared Legacy Farm, but you can think of onboarding emails. I've mentioned private Facebook groups as well. You can send 
um, printed newsletters as well, of course, and have open days. All of that will just mean that you get a good response from the community. And that's really what it's all about. CSAs are amazing in the sense that they engage the local community. The farmer benefits from having a, an available market, from support. You get to meet new families. You get to eat fresh, healthy, locally grown food. We're really proud to support our local CSA here. And I hope you can benefit from one where you are based. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, please subscribe to the channel and we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching.